everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Incredibly large, warm crowd we have today. My name is Catherine Duquette. I'll be fil facilitating this conversation, but I want everyone to know that this is our conversation. So we'll have a few points in my chat with John today uh, in which you can ask questions. So just be prepared to keep those bubbling. Uh, a few announcements before I invite John on stage. He's going to talk about the future of immersive storytelling, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> number one is, uh, everyone, this is a media convention, and there is no media convention without a hashtag. So just remember, tweet away all your glee with hashtag MCB17. Okay, also in your brochure, your program, you'll see a QR co code. And um, feel free at any point to give your impressions of your experience today, either throughout the conversation, um, you should be listening, uh, or post the conversation. So before we begin, I wanna let you know, just in case you didn't read your program, John Gaeta is the one, the person we wanna be speaking with about the future of immersive storytelling. He is the co-founder and executive creative director of LMX Lab. This is Lucasfilm's immersive experience division, okay? And he is also the mastermind behind the award-winning visual effects of the Matrix trilogy. Okay, so everybody, just a little warmer, go ahead and Get it rolling. So John, tell us, blue pill or red? Okay. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> Welcome to the stage, John. Thanks. Thank you. So. We'll get our answer about the blue pill, red pill, throughout this conversation. Uh, now, many of you consider, consider many of us consider you uh, the, a creator, an inventor of new forms of cinema, and more recently, of new forms of immersive media and experiences. So, in a way, we could say that you have come full circle in Depicts, depicting fictional realities in alternate realities uh, to creating them for us to experience. Would you say that? Yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So tell me a bit about your experience with ILM XLab. What kind of things are you working on? Okay, well, um, for folks who may not really be following um, <clears throat> that thread. Uh, it's been a, somewhat of a long uh, arc since these days when we, we worked on this film and um, had uh, many uh, hours, if not years, of interesting uh, conversation about what, you know, what the future could be, what virtual reality could be, um, and at the time, uh, it, it, was, it felt like science fiction, but it was the time that that film was made. Um, you know, the, the internet and uh, the idea of uh, a connected world mm -hmm. was really uh, starting to surge. And um, I think uh, folks began to resonate uh, with that idea back then. Now, why, um, so gonna pivot. So, so we'd, I can draw a dot from those times where it was ideas, thinking about that, to, to today, where, um, you know, advancements in technology and such has uh, brought us to a place where we can start to ponder uh, actually uh, creating the fabric of uh, hopefully not a, a, a dystopian, dark, and sinister matrix, but uh, an optimistic um, and uh, beautiful, expressive platform uh, to come. So, uh, ILM X Lab, what's that? Yeah. So, uh, in the wandering uh, uh, journey between these uh, points, um, 
I uh, was lucky enough to be invited by uh, friends who had, after all sorts of their own uh, pivots and migrations, uh, sort of arrived at Lucasfilm. And it was around the time uh, that George Lucas was transitioning uh, to Disney, or the Lucasfilm was transitioning to Disney, and then Disney was preparing to go for a decade mm. of new story in the Star Wars universe, and which is a complete rarity um, you know, in cinema that uh, a group knows that it's going to tell stories for 10 years or what have you, however long it really goes. But, um, so that was an interesting uh, new development and friends who were there and encouraged me to come and uh, to some degree, uh, you know, uh, join and, you know, to some degree disrupt uh, in a way that uh, was very fitting of uh, the identity of Lucasfilm, because it has always tried to invent, um, has always experimented in platforms early, you know, because uh, Star Wars is a universe that many people want to engage in, in different forms and different types of media. I'm going to center myself. That's great. And, um, <laughs> and so, ILM X Lab, so what is that? So, Three or four years ago, I um, and a couple of colleagues thought that um, there was going to be uh, the rise of immersive platforms of various sorts coming mm -hmm. in these years. And so we began this uh, group, entity, division, whatever you want to call it, that was going to, the charter was to explore a new form, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for creating a, a universe you can step into or uh, discovering stories in a unique way um, and sort of uh, mix these things together, Star Wars and experimental uh, forms. So that's what ILM, ILM X Lab, uh, just to go a little bit further, I would say, I would describe it as having like two uh, primary missions, two branches. Uh, one mission is to explore not just VR, but mixed reality, uh, various forms of immersive projection, theme parks. Um, it, it could be way more experimental than that. Really, like any form of emergent media uh, for these coming times. And that's one branch, and that's why it has the lab word attached. The other branch, though, is that, um, you know, we believe at a certain point that there will be this thing called immersive entertainment, right? And it'll be like, yeah, immersive entertainment. It's just another, another um, canvas, another platform. Uh, and so we're endeavoring to actually try to incrementally build our way to the point where we can uh, create a process, a process for development mm -hmm. and creation and, and uh, distribution, releasing right into the future theater systems, whatever those are, mm -hmm. be they home or location. So the other branch of X Lab is really like uh, endeavoring to become you know, a creator and producer and distributor of immersive entertainment. So there, it's a, like a long, but I thought I would lay that's, it out. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, a great starting point for, uh, to understand what ILMX Lab is doing. Um, first, you had mentioned Disney, working with Disney. And I understand that there's Disney and Star Wars Land, mm -hmm. which is in the realm of theme parks, correct? Um, so what are you doing in, in this theme park world, what kind of things are you developing there? Well, you know, I mean, th okay, throughout this talk, I'm going to have to only <laughs> say what I can say. Um, yeah, X Lab is definitely participating in creating new media for that park. Okay. Um, and um, the best, the most that I could really say is that this is, um, you know, the Imagineers are. So, you know, born from Walt Disney's sort of heart, and they are all, they have always been since their inception about this idea of translating, you know, story and worlds that were built in cinema, right? And translating that into a place you can walk into, mm -hmm. right? Immersion really accelerated quite a bit under Walt Disney's Aegis. He understood 
that people wanted uh, to go further than just the theater, but to have some form of wish fulfillment, right? The whole uh, build the wonder that you can really walk into. Um, and so that is a model, if you, if you will, right, for things that are coming. So the Imagineers, you know, they're evolving like everybody, and, um, you know, Star Wars land, you know, and things to come in theme parks, I think, are just going to be moving. There's going to be an evolution of the way theme parks are created and experienced. Right. I imagine a virtual reality immersive experience is kind of this perfect blend of the cinematic experience with the theme pet theme park experience. And I'm wondering if there's a convergence in the development of theme parks and the virtual reality experience, if there's some kind of... Yeah, wonder. well, of course, they're going to be... There, there's opportunities for all, all sorts of portals and trap doors because, um, you know, the designing a theme park today uh, happens extensively in a computer, so you already... Yeah. You are already... Um, simulating uh, the experience of being there well in advance and so too is the um, there are you know new ways that people are beginning to imagine and visualize cinema uh, as well so visualization you know this term I mean people in a long time back they used to make little models of sets they would build and same too with the theme parks. And then, you know, over time, people began to uh, use, you know, computer graphics to visualize uh, not just settings, you know, not just scenery, but actual scenes and such, right? So visualization is a common part of cinema design now, and so too with pretty much everything, right? So visualization has become rather prolific, uh, and we've been doing visualization for a solid you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years to some degree um, with, you know, it gives you insight, depends on how you do it, but the tools of visualization are now evolving mm -hmm. along towards these emergent platforms too, so people are beginning to visualize cinema and theme parks with VR, they will do that with mixed reality quite soon, yeah. and what is going to happen is that uh, it will become a common practice and behavior for creatives to actually step inside their content through these visualizations before they shoot some of this stuff or build some of this stuff. And after a while, that'll become so common that it's a short a jump between I'm used to being immersed in this content in a planning sense to the content I'm going to make at some point is going to be manifested as, in and of itself, a complementary or component experience. So there'll, there'll be cinema and there'll be virtual cinema and there'll be the things seen in cinema, worlds and destinations, right, will be places that you can walk into as a completely new form of experience. Okay, so you mentioned this idea, this notion of destinations. Could you, could you expand on that a little bit? So if we're going into an immersive environment or situation, whether it be theme park, theme park or let's, let's talk about virtual reality, that's where we're here, um, why we're here, uh, what is this sense of destination? How does this affect story? Yes, um, so I suppose there are a lot of different, there's a, a lot of different ways people are going to approach, you know, immersive platforms, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, and I, I, I keep saying that because I don't want it to get, us to always get just fixated on VR, because mixed reality is potentially going to be bigger. Um, but the, you know, so yes, there'll be like, yeah, there'll be like simple, simple stuff going on where your, you know, continuation of your connected life, that's a whole form of, you know, uh, and things that you, data and things and stuff you'll you'll want to do communications with friends as avatars stuff like that, but um, there'll be gaming of course and there'll be like a very visceral sort of engaging mm -hmm. uh, gaming to some degree. You know, telling stories. If people are trying to talk about it, trying to understand what that is going to be like. There's a lot of talk about that. We've been talking about that for two or three years now at nauseum. The idea of the destination, though, is, is, is such that um, 
you know, there is a place. So in a, in, a, in a fictitious universe like, you know, Star Wars, there are many places, right, in that universe. And so if we focus on a particular setting area, right, and we build that in a particular way, then we'll be able to at some point explore that place. So we can, we can begin with the idea, the idea, that's my Long Island accent, <laughs> the idea of being there, right? The idea of being in a place, right? We're in a place right now. We'll go out on the street, we'll be in a place. We'll go, you know, travel somewhere to another country, we'll be in a place. So, you know, using reality as an example, <laughs> <laughs> just being in a place, walking out onto the street corner, and people pass you by, and they're caught up in conversation, and you're drawn into their conversation, or something happens over here, a car accident happens over there. That's a sense of being in a place where story is unfolding. Those are stories, right? You could follow those people having the conversation further. You know, maybe you can eavesdrop. Maybe you can somehow join, right? So the idea of building a destination where all of that stuff can, can occur uh, is first, right? As sort of like a founding principle, if we can make a destination. Then, um, for those who are people who are really like, they, they're storytellers, right? They want to tell us a story. They want to, you know, we sometimes want to have complete free will to, like in a game, choose where we want to yes. go, do what we want to do, like set the pace as we want to set. And then, you know, we go to the cinema to be told a story, and often these stories are so fantastic, you could never dream them up yourself. You go to a story to see something out of a particular creator's imagination, right? Because you couldn't think that up, right? And you want that unexpected, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thing to happen. So in the destination, we can plant all sorts of story. It can be found. You can, f you can discover it as you wander. And um, there are going to be a lot of varieties of that. I mean, I think that, for example, you know, if uh, during the course of this, uh, talk here, uh, the ceiling broke and, pe and some uh, aliens came in and I ran across the, the, uh, the that's a stupid example, but no, that if that happens, <laughs> if that happens, happen. right, yeah. we didn't expect that and we could follow that and, and that would be, um, you know, something you could plant everywhere. Uh, some folks will want to take the role, some people will want to stand in the shoes Mm -hmm. of those who are in the, those situations, and that's a sort of a different way of right. approaching it. I understand uh, currently what you're working on is it's more in the realm of let's create a, a setting, a, a space in which one could enter and interact in a very, like, gui a gently guided way. So it's a safe, safe space for people to go in and play and have a little bit of agency but not feel Wild, unfree. Sure, safe un or unsafe. Un <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, um, we. I, I think that um, you know, you you can look at uh, the advancements of different media types in like ten year, twenty year, thirty year chunks, and you can see remarkable, remarkable advancements. So, I don't think it's out of the question at all to imagine that at some point in the next ten years, maybe. Um, that, you know, supposed computer constructs, right, look flawlessly real because they are built, you know, partly from uh, things that we have captured from the real world. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot going on in simulation now that uh, attempts to learn from nature, not attempt to replace it, right? So right. there are things that <clears throat> analysis, and um, deep learning, you know, can um, provide to make the nuances of a reactive world uh, compelling and believable. Uh, so in 10 years' time, it's really not out of the question that we can be in a completely realistic, photographic-seeming virtual reality, mm -hmm. right, that, that will, you know, flex against your, you know, interaction, right, your gestures. Mm -hmm. um, Further than that, there'll be this pursuit of, you know, uh, it's a term called haptics, which is to add touch, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So, the you know, so, uh, you know, the medium 
uh, and it's both VR and MR, but the media, it's a perceptual medium coming. It's not like just media, right? right? It's not just, you know, ones and zeros. It's a, it's a perceptual media that is coming, one in which your mind is, uh, to some degree, questioning whether something is uh, physically true. Um, and it's already, there are already signs that uh, people are having some success and making some relatively right. good stuff. Now, I under, if, if this is about the future of immersive storytelling. Okay, we'll get down the road Let's now. Let's just go for it, because really, storytelling, the stories that we tell don't really change. It's the way we tell them mm -hmm. that changes. And um, you've been a great innovator in this. And I'm wondering, how is the immersive experience, the virtual reality, is that changing the way we tell stories or perceive stories? Um, I read something very recently about two, uh, from two psychologists that said uh, the experience taking that a reader goes through in experience in taking the experience of their protagonist actually changes the way they perceive the world and behave within it. And I'm wondering how much experience you have in trying these materials in the lab with people or not, if that is, if it's having a greater effect than even reading a novel or watching a film. Well, the gr word greater is, in, I don't know if that, I mean, it, it depends, right? right? So I'm not going to order, right, the impact of a particular medium over it because some people read a book and their imagination is filling all of that in and it has more impact than the film they saw of the same thing. So it really depends, I think, on the person and the presentation sure. um, in terms of impact. But the one thing that is true, again, back to this perception thing that um, if it is done, like there is a lot of stuff that is called VR right now that is not really high fidelity and immersive quite yet. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that is sort of, you know, tiptoeing towards this. I mean, it's cool to walk around the thing and you're like, wow, that's, that's different, right? Um, you get a feeling from it, right? It's, it's a lot, it's about, again about the senses. You get, you get a feeling about something, but you know, once you start getting into uh, high fidelity, high frame rate VR, right? And the reason why I say high frame rate, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, in the last, and I'm going to get to your answer, the, the last three or four years there have been certain, I guess you would, I guess they are breakthroughs and it has to do with frame rate. And, um, you know, the, uh, a person, uh, I'm going to try to, I'm not, I am not a scientist and, or an engineer, so I will be totally down on your level right now. <laughs> um, if you say, okay, movies are shot at 24 frames or 30 frames a second, and, um, and so you can only see so much information with that many flicks of image at you. Uh, and then you can get these cameras, I'm talking about in the real world, you just get these cameras that can shoot really high speed, so maybe you get one of these high speed cameras that can shoot 1,000 frames or 10,000 frames a second, so you're getting like, you know, a lot, of inf a lot of detail and a lot of information. And usually, you know, if you did that and played that in a, in a, in a system that only showed it at 30 frames a second, then it looks like slow motion, right? Super slow motion. But you can also play the 10,000 frame per second thing you video, you uh, captured at 10,000 frames, right? So now it looks, now it's real time, if you will, right? It's, mo it's supposedly the one-to-one -one time, temporally, as, when, as the event, but you're getting 10,000 times the amount of information. So, uh, you know, what do, what's the frame rate of reality? You know, a lot of people are wondering. Uh, it's like, is it infinite? Is it like a thousand frames a second? Is it like, who knows? And there are people who spend a lot of time wondering about that. Mm -hmm. So what is the breakthrough? The breakthrough is that in the last few years or so, people have been able to uh, overclock the frame rate of game engines and other, you know, playback systems so that now, you know, the supposed high-end 
VR headsets, they show like 90 frames a second, and some can go up higher. So like something happened after 60, as soon as you got to 90, it's like all of a sudden this kind of like perceptual focus occurred, started to occur, where you were like, wow, right? You're now like there's something happening, right, to your brain where you're like, okay, that seems, there's something physical seeming about that, right? And you will see people who are doing a lot of 90 FPS, you know, VR things. They, they're like cats, you know, like you throw a cat into a new room and a cat is like, whoa, 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 right? And they're like, right? That's the closest thing I can think of to people who have never experienced high frame VR. VR. They're like suddenly turned into this like, whoa, look at that ping pong ball and, you know, check out that glint of light, right? Um, so, what was your question? <laughs> I know it was, there was a reason. I went down this road for some. What is the future? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> What's the future? No, future storytelling, storytelling. Future All right, let's get back to storytelling. So, well, okay, so if the world's a stage, so is a virtual world, right? So, um, people are going to broadcast themselves into VR destinations in all sorts of ways. Really fantastic, remarkable ways, right? They're going to be characters. They're going to be like strange, abstract things. They're going to be, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be the ocean today. I'm going to be, you know, this character. Um, and you said mixed reality also was going to be huge, even bigger than VR. Yes. So in terms of storytelling, though, it's, I, you know, I don't have that answer. It's as, it's as many answers as there are creators who want to try something different. Like, we would have never guessed the great diversity of games that have occurred right. in the last 20 years, or the remarkable spectrum of film approaches and storytelling approaches in film. It's as, it's wide, as wide as it can be. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's really going to be amazing, of course, is the fact that, yes, some can be curated, some could be pre-recorded and captured in a way, but there's going to be a lot that's basically going to be live streamed straight in, right? So some people could be there wandering as just, I'm here, uh, wandering the destination, and then there'll be other people who will be live streaming in there as performers for these other people, and all different kinds of combinations of that. And so I think uh, again, yes, uh, all sorts of variations of, of f thoughtful events and moments and strings of them not necessarily laid out in the same sort of like linear timeline that cinema has been. Mm -hmm. A lot of it will be sort of like disconnected, but you know, disconnected spatially perhaps, uh, but connected in so far as they add up to a, a collective story and you know, like uh, television, I suppose, it can keep, it can, episodically can keep going. There will be the ability in a destination where, like, if you were to say the entire, like, story that took place in cinema, if you could, like, draw that as some kind of, you know, line of here's where everybody went and what they did over time across the duration that the story is told in cinema, you could just take that spline and just lay it into the destination, like here's one, right? And then you can have another one that crosses and another one that crosses until you've basically just stack up these, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a, it's a it shift in the way we perceive time and yeah. place, that it's all stacked on one, and one on top of another. Um, very, very interesting. I do want to, I have a few more questions, but I do want to just touch base with the audience to see if anybody has a question at this moment. Um, we have a gentleman here, right over here. Yeah, please. Um, is there a mic for yes. this gentleman? Yes. yes, thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for your um, insights uh, right now. I have a question concerning more of the to the storytelling, maybe more meet a kind of um, meta even. I don't know the English word for that. Um, how do you kind of manage the different touch points the story has with the um, um, actual uh, people uh, reliving and um, experience the story. You have um, the, the films, and you said at the beginning that you have films planned for the next 10 years um, when Disney started diving into the um, uh, Star Wars universe. So you have, a, you have to have a big story arc for the whole 10 years, and 
the films are just notes where the stories that you can um, detail out with games, with immersive theme parks, with um, animated series, with to fill out the gaps in the backstory, something like that. How do you manage these immense um, data of, uh, of story and story arcing and, and character development? How do you deal with that in, in, in an immersive um, uh, storytelling? Great question. Um, well, one thing I would say just before you get to the immersive bit, um, so in our case, I mean, again, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Lucasfilm at this time was because, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the heart and home of Star Wars, the IP, and being such, uh, all things that all things in story that have anything to do with story and world you know evolution uh they are thought out and talked about there yeah so there's like human beings <laughs> there are humans there people wonderful people who plot right the trajectory of you know arc story arc so you know what is going to be the story of the skywalker family across you know, four or five films. What is, who are the characters that crossed that? You know, where are people going? But that's across, you know, and, you know, that's across all the different mediums that the stories are being told in. So, and they're being told in a lot of different mediums. So, like, yes, there's the cinema. There is, yeah, there are, like, big games, you know, interactive games. There are comic book series. There are books. There are theme park, actual small chapters of story that are actually mm -hmm. being created for that, and they do have to be plotted out in some form of a map. And right. in, the case of, in the case of Star Wars, there are people who are truly looking at the long arc of some of these things, like what is the evolution of, for of the Force, right? Will it evolve across these films? There's all sorts of... Um, arcs that people are, are, are watching. So, but to finish the question, the immersive bit, the immersive bit fits into this big map, right? So, if we want to choose a destination in Star Wars, we have to, A, you know, yes, we take it from the map, but then we need to understand where on the timeline any particular moment that you may find or experience where is that coming from and how does that relate to everything else? Some stuff is completely new. We might go to a very familiar place that has been seen in cinema, but choose to go like 100 years further or behind from the storylines of the films. And in these early days, it's, a, it's such a big deal. It is so, it's, it's a big lift to make some of these virtual reality experiences to try to create all of the components, right, to put these kinds of things together that these are not, the story parts are not like long, like long endeavors. There's, they're, they're, they're moments to some degree, right, in terms of the experimentation. The destination, you could build the destination and you could sit in there for hours if you choose, you know what I mean? But the story bits are much more deliberately selected right now. Right. Because it's all that we can do to manage the building of these things. Well, you're, you're in a very special environment in which you have the, it's like, it's like a, a very large scale game design environment where you have your story group right there and you have your technology development with uh, industrial magic and light and then Industrial light and magic. Industrial light and it's, magic, forgive me. Yeah. No, no, it's all right. Yeah. Um, no, that's, uh, and, and also Skywalker sound. Yeah, we have. We all have, these components we, together to yes. develop. Yeah. It's remarkable. It's the thing that makes it, I mean, so the, what's unique about what George Lucas built was this like closed loop system. So you could, you know, have an idea, express it. Somebody could paint a picture that suddenly sparks all these other ideas. There are folks who then will talk about that and will write to that. So now they're writing storylines on these, in these different mediums, but then there are uh, a few folks that are doing some rather advanced, you know, graphics work who are doing experimental things there. We have Skywalker Sound that is now really jumping into spatial sound design, 
right? Sound that you walk into and through. Um, and the whole company is wired to all its different media pieces. So it, it, across all these different channels, you have this, this layering of skill sets from still, I'm going to just draw this simple drawing to, OK, that simple drawing is now this remarkable you know, uh, experiential media type, right? You can, you can do that there. Uh, and how does, how do you decide on which story you implement in this technology and, and vice versa? I mean, that's a pretty symbiotic relationship. How are you, it, how much of the story is making that decision or is the technology making that decision? Story is heavy, it's, story is very heavily involved. Yeah. You know, we, that's the only, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right, all the tech, I mean, everybody wants to believe this, but it's true. All the tech in the world is meaningless if there's nothing to put on the platform. Right. Some people's solution, you know, like the tech titans that have created search platforms and social media platforms, mm -hmm. their approach to this is we will build a platform to facilitate everybody, use, everyday folks, putting themselves into it, right? Expressing themselves. So it's this world of user-generated everything, you know? Um, but once you start getting beyond the social uh, types of content and you start trying to figure out something that is actually really thought through and designed and engineered, yeah, it, it, will re it reverts back to, like, why would you make a movie or story in the first place, right? There has right. to be a reason you want, there's something you want to express, a story you need to express, right? right? And, a, and, and in our case, you know, it's, a part, it's a, along a journey of stories that right. are kind of going to somewhere. And what happens when you put your, what we typically relate to uh, a character in, in watching a film, what happens when you put yourself into this environment and you, in a way, are becoming a character in this environment? How does that affect our relationship with other characters? Do you have characters nudging us along, guiding us along? Is that how the there's story There's all evolves? different. Again, all there's like no right or wrong approach. Um, right. You know, uh, you know, there's one method where you can follow. You can be a follower right. and you can sort of orbit in the expository surrounds you know, of something taking place, but then there are other opportunities where you can step inside the shoes of one of the characters. But at that point, you have to be flexible. So the question is, you know, do you want to lay out an arc? You know what I mean? Do you want to lay out acts that you will pass through this moment where things are going to converge and happen, but you've left the middle bit, right, flexible enough so that you might get there differently mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. um, take a different path, you know, resolve situations or conflicts if you're in the shoes of a character, resolve them dif in different ways, right. right? But you may eventually end up, and in our case, you will end up passing through some point that we want you to pass through. Um, so we, you know, we still want to maintain the role of the storyteller, even right. if you are doing stuff like that. I, maybe it would be valuable to see one of your videos on the mixed. Yeah, we could. Okay, then we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Um, just uh, video number two, I believe. If three. We could have three. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. What is this technology that we're seeing here? <sighs> okay, so <laughs> this is a test. That was a test. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of tests. Uh, so quite simply. What that is, is, you know, mixed reality for some folks who are less familiar is very different than VR insofar as obviously we're mixing, like compositing, you know, to use that kind of term, we're mixing uh, these, these elements, these graphical elements over the real world. And it requires knowing the shapes of the real world and it requires knowing where you are relative to these same shapes, and the, the nature of those experiences are going to be very, very different because we're going to be inside them with, we're going to be actually literally represented ourselves, right? Like, so your friends are there with you as opposed to your friends have to be some avatar 
in VR, right? So now we're there. And the potential of using the, the real world as, as the setting, as the backdrop, mm -hmm. really opens up amazing possibilities. For example, if you like uh, Miyazaki films, Miyazaki is like a master of like, he shows you an invisible world that you didn't know exists, right? You go into the woods and all these little spiritual beings live in the woods and then you follow little spiritual beings and you see like a glimpse into their lives and conflicts and all of that. Um, so imagine you, you know, walk into a real ancient forest, a real forest, and in there is a Miyazaki created, you know, world of stories and characters and such. And over and over and over, this can, the world can be a backdrop, mm -hmm. you know. So there's a fellow, Martin from Trickster, he works on Marvel movies. Okay, so imagine we uh, are in New York City or Chicago or Berlin and uh, lo and behold, overlaid over the city is a, is a full-blown, <laughs> right, insane happening, right, from that universe, from those storylines, but just laid over the top at epic scale. Mm -hmm. So that is also coming, and that's going to be a, a really interesting new canvas. Um, again, just like with VR, it can be passive, semi-passive, it can be reactive to you, it could be interactive, there's just a million different ways that it could play out. But, you know, the reason why we're experimenting is because we think, in the end, people are going to crave having these experiences with their friends and family and mm -hmm. loved ones, or with just anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So, inevitably, I think that mixed reality is going to be the largest and most compelling of the mm -hmm. platforms. So we're wondering like, okay, what are the very, very basic things you need to do? As far as Magic Leap technology is concerned, um, you know, you can try to find out what it is online as much as the next person. Definitely. Um, I know that you have, we have a question? Great. Hi. Well, hello. Hi, I'm Fabian. Thank you for your insights. Um, you spoke a lot about theme parks in the beginning, about uh, virtual reality, about the uh, technology, and now about um, uh, our air. And uh, I mean, uh, there has been some, some rumors, you know, that uh, maybe Magic Leap is overhyped. You said uh, it's going to be a big uh, driver in the future, um, in the perception. But uh, I really wonder, in, um, like regarding your experience and your insights from the US, in the short term, like in the next three, five years, what's going to be the biggest driver for VR? Is it stationary VR or is it uh, maybe um, the VR that we, that we have that we perceive at, uh, at home with our own uh, devices? Okay, I'll take that actually. I'll, I'll give you a two-part answer to that. Uh, the, um, so we live in a world of bubbles. They inflate really quickly, uh, just, just the nature of social media. And um, uh, whether you call that a political bubble or a business bubble or a tech bubble, there's bubbles everywhere, right? So the, uh, the blogosphere wants to write and thrive, you know what I mean, uh, and create excitement because it's good for them too. So with Magic Leap, I hear people say, yeah, overhyped and such, but the reason why it's overhyped is because at the kernel of that is this dream that everybody wants, right? Like, oh, yeah, I want that. I want to have a world that has fantasy overlaid over my reality or all these sorts of things. And there's a lot of idealistic talk about what that could be, some of which is we're talking about today. But the overhyping is not really... Is that over overhyping is the amplification of that. And the same as there are people who are, you know, dreamers with big ambitions or visionary types that have started new things, like look at George Lucas, you know, he started this cold visual effects, new world of cinema. The Magic Leap folks are just really authentically enthusiastic about the future. They are like, they believe in it, they're trying to make it happen. I love them because they want fantasy in our lives, right? That's why. But 
Um, as far as the business side of things, you know, again, the culture of the blogosphere, they just, they, they attach themselves to it. But they're an authentic group. As far as um, adoption of VR, my, uh, you know, what will happen is that just like when movies began, you know, they invented cameras and then they needed projectors, they invented projectors, you know, a hundred some odd years back, right? But no person living in their frontier town, <laughs> you know, ever could put a projector in their house. They had to go to the one theater in town that had the projector. And the beginning of cinema as a platform was enabled because people could go to a common location and experience it. And it's, it, you know, so now we have a theater system. And there's all sorts of theater systems, you know, every screen we own is a theater system, if you will, right? So VR, you know, is not, just like in the beginning of, uh, you know, the internet and smartphones, you know, the early adopters, there's a certain type of person, they'll try, and that's just in their nature. But uh, the average person is a little intimidated. Oh, I'm not sure if I can, uh, that's, it's a computer, it seems, you know what I mean? It could be complicated, turns out, People have made those things intuitive and easy to do over time, right? Especially smartphones, like your grandma can use a smartphone. So VR is probably really going to take hold for the common person anywhere by way of a theater system, and I think we're seeing the first stages of that. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I mean, you can see great hunger for that actually in Asia, in China, you know, where the Vive people are based, and um, there are at this point thousands of VR cafes kind of going up a lot in Shanghai, but there's a lot of VR cafes. It's a really interesting idea, a little entrepreneurial idea that, you know, a, a person, you know what I mean, that just isn't intimidated. The early adopter type can just set up some VR cafe social place, and that's the beginning of a theater system, and that's what I think is going to happen everywhere. And it, it, it's not happening fast enough, and there's no real reason. I think um, partly the, the fact that the high fidelity VR stuff, you know, has the big tether, so they're, they're being slow, and those tethers will come off soon enough. Uh, the mobile device oriented systems, they're easier to democratize because you just get the phone with your phone plan and suddenly, you know, they plug, they're plugging into the same system that widely distributes smartphones to us and eventually people will have, you know, those types of goggles. Uh, but those goggles kind of only go to a certain level, et cetera. But, so, but they will democratize much faster. So if this is, this is happening, this is just, yes, uh, just one, one question, I'm, I see you. If this is happening, um, what can we expect in our experience of reality as we know it? I know that's kind of a oh. huge question, but... Uh, if, You're swinging for the fences now. I might as well. I'm here. This is what we What's going to happen to What's reality? What's going to happen to reality? Aren't we going to be just so consumed by a virtual experience? I know that this kind of notion of escape has been a big subject in your explora exploration of this technology. Um, and I, I, you know, I think to say escape is underestimating the value of why we enter stories. It's actually to expand our world rather than to escape our wor world. Um, but can reality become commodified if we're so involved in this other virtual experience? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it'll become a commodity. Um, the Nobody in this room probably is in danger of giving up, you know, large swaths of reality in their life. Everyone likes their social media, so I think that people will try the sort of mixed reality in particular uh, because, you know, at this point, having my social feeds, my communications, my texts is a must-have in my life, and everybody else in this room guaranteed has a smartphone, and that's what they do half the, half the day is check it. So, what will happen for certain is that we, w we will transfer this obsession with scrolling these phones, and we're just going to transfer that to some... It'll take some years, mm -hmm. right? But 
if once people feel, once they, uh, once they feel unintimidated, they'll put on glasses and they'll just get rid of having to take this out of their pocket and they'll just run this stuff like always on, right? Um, I think a lot of people will do that and it could take 10 years maybe, but I can easily see a lot of people doing that. Um, the danger is, um, there's two, a couple of places where danger lies and that is, um, you know, addiction to that, you know, is inevitable. And that's probably like generic, like, okay, so I would say a lot of people in this room are addicted to coffee, <laughs> right? So that might be your only addiction, but it, you have it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people will be addicted to this, like coffee, right? But it can't get much, much worse. And um, I think that there will be people who just like their sort of mixed fantasy life better and, you know, will not be able to turn it off. But again, I don't think the folks in this room are as much in danger because a lot of us, well, in fact, everybody here has grown up with a steady diet of reality so we know it could be great, <laughs> right? In fact, I like it the best. But for kids, for young kids who will, like the generation that has been introduced to devices and now that is just part of the fabric of their days and entertainment, There'll be a round of, there'll be a generation that will come in and they'll just have these immersive glasses of various sorts. Um, and they'll think it's just natural and normal to spend hours and hours. So if we me remember when people were always stressing about the fact that people were watching TV for like six hours or eight hours a day, right? Like, oh my God, TV, we're not going to, we're not living our life. So we got rid of the, T people are doing less TV because they transferred it all onto these other screens. So now everyone's doing that for hours a day. And that will, that's going to happen in yeah. VR and MR. And that's a danger. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we've run out of time. But I, I, okay. I know. I Fine. know. I just, it's so lovely to talk to you, John. I do want to hit um, this nice person who's been waiting for, uh, to ask a question. And then I'll have, we'll close with a very valuable question. Okay. Um, wh what's uh, your hi, question? My name is Hi, my name is Usman. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the insights. My question is regarding that uh, all this entertainment we take as a part of uh, relaxing and enjoying ourselves. But with headsets on and so much happening around you, don't you think that everything would be very hectic or people will be tired? It will be like having an out of control child running all around you. You have to look around everywhere. Or some of us enjoy these movies like on our bed, lying down and relaxing. How do you guys plan to tackle such a thing with virtual reality and immersive technologies, how will we in do this entertainment then? Without getting hurt? Or getting tired or exhausted? <laughs> yeah, I know. I think some people are going to get really hurt. I think some people fall downstairs. Some people might jump out windows. <laughs> Social media some is people doing might. That. Some people might panic because we've put computer-generated yeah. dinosaurs in the street. And I'm not joking. <laughs> so yeah, you got to be careful. So, in the vein of being careful, blue pill or, or red pill? Uh, blue or red? Purple. Purple. You said it already. You said it. So, what does that mean? Purple What's the pill. purple pill? All right, purple pill. Purple pill, purple pill is not Viagra. In, this, in, the, in the context of this conversation, that's not what we're talking about. In the context of this conversation, purple, okay, g blue, reality, red, right, completes immersion, submersion, belief in your virtual world, right? What Neo was saying at the beginning, right? So uh, forget all these early clunky days where there's a million little headsets and some do VR and some do high frame rate, some do low. There's a mixed reality thing and there, you know, forget all that. In about whatever, 10, 20 years, you have one glass, one set of glasses that basically can dial between zero reality and 100 complete and total immersion, right? All in one. That's where things are going to go. And in doing so, if we were to say, okay, we're all here together, we all have these glasses on, and right here on this table is a teeny little character, right? And that's the only thing in this entire room that is virtual. But it is absolutely going to be the case that we can start replacing Oh, we could reskin this stage, we can reskin these walls and put ourselves in a place, but we're still sitting here. We can, over time, we're going to be able to 
put avatars and other characters right over the top of our own bodies. And so slowly but surely, you can scrub you know, between pure reality and incrementally replace things that we're driving right, all the way to the point where we're in a completely fictitious world, right? And about that time, computers are going to get so smart and powerful, they're going to know we're doing this, and they're going to start really keeping us in there a good long time, and at that time, they're going to probably take over the world. There you go. <laughs> On that note, John, a round of applause. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>